it's all right so are you willing to stay for the recording of this top event yes okay well i'm so glad because you guys are with us teachers of pronunciation as you know are tops and participants you are all introducing yourself in the chat which is great our activity today is project based assignments to flip your pronunciation class in person or online and we have here your trusty top co-coordinator and co-founder -co Marsha Chan along with my assistant coordinator Randy Reitmeyer give us a smile and a wave please Randy hello hello good to be yes. here yes sir and uh, we have uh in thinking about us, we have J.D. Elvin, who has been my co-coordinator for the last couple of years. Uh, some of you are CATISO members, which is really terrific. Uh, we also have some people who have joined us today as guests of CATISO. And maybe you're considering becoming a member. And if you'd like to know some member benefits, you know, you can really join this very vibrant group of teachers of English to speakers of other languages, whether you are in California or another state, another country, another part of the world, you have access to our peer reviewed language publication, Katisal Journal. So you can find that on our website. Uh, monthly Katiso update announcements, letting you know some things that are going on, have gone on, are coming up. Discounts to regional and state conferences. You have free access to an unlimited number of interest groups like TOP and levels like all the way from K through 12, da -da 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 -da, community uh, colleges and college universities. And in between there, we also have adult ed and IEPs. And we have chapters, which are based on geographical regions. Of course, you'll have the opportunity to interact and network, learn from each other um, with Katisal members and guests at conferences and events like these. We have an opportunity for online discussions with people who are worried about concerned with, have ideas about, things that are uh, helpful for our instruction of English to speakers of other languages through our message boards. Now, some of you may be looking for a job or some sort of employment. So we have a job bank and that's something you can get access to. We have, um, we'd like to share resources with you. We also have money. We have opportunities for awards and for grants for both teachers and students through the California, uh, what do we call it? We call it Katisal Education Foundation, which is our sister organization that helps dole out some money to those of us who are interested in either doing a project or getting some sort of award for what we've already done. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to my assistant, Randy Reitmeyer. Go ahead. Thank you, Marcia. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Uh, Dr. Marie Webb has taught undergraduate and graduate speaking and pronunciation courses in Macau, China, Japan, South Korea, and in California community colleges. I've been lucky enough to get to know Marie through, uh, you know, as one of her colleagues at UC Santa Barbara's EMS, English for Multilingual Students program, where she teaches a course in pronunciation and other oral skills for undergraduate students and a course in pronunciation and other oral skills for graduate students and where she's an evaluator of international teaching assistants or ITAs. 
Professor Webb has conducted several research studies on the flipped classroom in ELT internationally and within the United States, including her 2016 Catisal Journal publication with Dr. Evelyn Doman, Does the Flipped Classroom Lead to Increased Gains in Learning Outcomes in ESL EFL Contexts? where they found that students in flipped classrooms scored significantly higher on grammar SLOs than their peers in control courses. Isn't that interesting? Pronunciation makes you better in grammar. And uh, their 2020 study impacts of flipped classrooms on learner attitudes towards technology enhanced language learning which found that students in a flipped classroom more positively valued technology for language learning over time. Today, Marie Webb is here to present to us on the topic of project-based assignments to flip your pronunciation class. So please welcome Dr. Marie Webb. Hi all. Uh, Randy, can I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please. Yes, you may. Well, give me just a second to get that set up. And thank you for that awesome introduction, Randy. It's so fun to be uh, here presenting and working with everybody um, in the organization. And I hope I continue to um, stay more involved with you all. I was uh, uh, involved heavily in the San Diego Catisal chapter uh, back when I lived in San Diego. And it's been quite a while since I've presented anything for TESOL. So thank you guys for having me today. Um, before I get into my presentation, um, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about how I conceptualized this today. Um, I know uh, everyone here is uh, probably familiar with the flipped classroom and also teaching oral skills courses um, and or designing project-based assignments. And so when I was planning this presentation today, I initially decided that I was going to share two of my project-based assignments with you all. Um, and then as I continued working on this presentation, I thought, you know, um, I think it's gonna be best that I just share one project-based assignment and get into the nitty gritty details of how that uh, uh, flipped classroom component, um, all of those activities uh, and uh, little assignments, how they all build up to that final project-based assignment in the course. And so with that said, this presentation is gonna be really practical. Um, I have pulled out lots of little assignments and activities from my class that I um, am sharing with you all today. Uh, but I'm gonna begin my presentation uh, for about the first 20 minutes, um, sharing a lot about what's going on with the current research in um, flipped classroom. Um, instruction in English language teaching. Um, and for those of you who are kind of new to the concept of flipping, I'm going to do a, a little bit of a review of that before I get into um, the specific details and examples from my own course today. Um, and then we have plenty of time left at the end for q and A. Q &A. I've left about 25, 30 minutes for q and A Q&A today. So um, feel free to stick around after the presentation or um, shoot me an email um, later on if you have any questions about anything that came up in the presentation um, or anything on my PowerPoint slides if you get access to these later on. I'm more than happy to um, continue uh, taking those questions afterwards. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. And uh, when I think about when I first started flipping the classroom, it was not, such a beautiful uh, process. Uh, it was uh, really time consuming and uh, also a really scary thing. And um, it can be really challenging to flip a classroom. Um, students and instructors might need to learn a lot of new technology. Instructors, instructors might be wondering, you know, what the nuances of a flipped classroom really look like, what really happens in a flipped classroom. Um, but there are very simple ways that you can take tasks that you would normally do inside of the classroom and use those as flipped classroom assignments online. 
Um, and really doing so opens up more time and space in your classroom for a lot more in person or online collaboration, one on one small group instruction that our students in, in our oral skills courses that are working on their pronunciation really crave and, and they really need. And so um, it's really exciting to share about this today. Um, I presented a, uh, I, I just want to uh, start with a little bit of my background and my history. I did present on the flipped classroom in a speaking course back at Catisil San Diego Regional Conference in 2014. And I, that was my first little poster presentation that I ever gave for Catisil. And um, I shared in that uh, presentation how I flipped a presentation in my oral skills course um, at a community college course back in California. Um, and so essentially what I did was I taught the process of rehearsal. I had my students collaborate on how they would be evaluated in the class. Um, and they recorded and they presented their presentations online on our learning management system instead of presenting them inside of the classroom. And so again, that presentation process um, became much more collaborative in nature and it had much more scaffolding in place. Students had much more practice presenting, um, working on pronunciation, et cetera, before that final assessment, um, because I gained back all of that class time that they would normally be presenting um, in class. Um, and so uh, I, I have done that in person in my in-person classes and then now during COVID um, in an online class. So I have examples to share with you that will uh, be useful for both if you're teaching in person or online. Um, and if you just wanted to read a little bit more about that flipped presentation assignment, I, I did write a, a newsletter article about it in the Catisil San Diego newsletter. So you guys can actually access that online if you want to read about that specific assignment, if you're interested in it. Um, and um, I have a few other resources here today that I'll be sharing with you. Um, and I just wanted to um, give you guys the links for those as well. So I'm going to go ahead and dive into um, an overview, and this is pretty brief, um, uh, an overview of the recent literature on flipped classroom uh, uh, findings in English for academic purposes context. And so um, I've been following the literature for quite some time. Um, I am reviewing for many scholarly journals and, and uh, reviewing some of the most recent literature on flipped classroom research in our field. Um, and what I've done for you all today is kind of summarized five major takeaways from the current research that's out there. And I'm just going to go through them briefly. And uh, then we'll revisit kind of what flipped classroom instruction is. And then I'm going to uh, dive into my examples for you all today. Um, so I'll just go over the five takeaways here and then uh, pull out some of the uh, literature for you guys briefly. Um, and uh, the first point is there really is uh, uh, this overall support for flipped learning across context in English language teaching. And when I say across context, the research is coming from all different types of English language classes around the world globally. Um, and um, my second takeaway is all of these researchers are finding that yes, students will adjust to flipped learning. And I'm going to share some uh, some uh, information with you all who might be kind of uh, concerned or maybe even critics of the flipped classroom today. Um, point number three, students uh, may achieve increased gains on learning outcomes. Yes, that's what we want in our classes. We want our students to do better. Number four, students will spend more time on the course content. And this is a really interesting uh, uh, point in the newer research that's coming out on the flipped classroom. And finally, uh, I think one of my favorite points, students enjoy videos. They really like seeing your face online when they're at home studying um, and non-text materials um, in addition to other materials that you might be using in your classroom. So um, Al Hori, he, he emailed me his meta-analysis um, from uh, all of the recent uh, studies on flipped classroom research in English language teaching. And so he looked at 56 different studies. Um, there were about 4,200 participants in all of those studies. Um, and what he found uh, was that 
uh, uh, the effect of flipped learning didn't really seem to vary by the age of students, which is really important to note. I get that question a lot, um, but it did vary by proficiency level in that your um, higher level students might have higher uh, gains from the flipped classroom experience, uh, which is an interesting point to note from all of these meta studies. Um, also, the, the researchers on the flipped classroom are not really looking into the question of, is flipped learning effective? We've kind of answered that question. Yes, flipped learning is effective. Now researchers are looking at how that effectiveness is actually being maximized in the classroom. And so we've kind of moved beyond my older research really asked, you know, is it effective? Are students learning? And now uh, researchers are building on that and they're moving past and beyond that question. Um, I pulled out um, a really great uh, uh, photo from my earlier study uh, back uh, in, at the University of Macau when I was flipping with uh, four or five of my colleagues. Um, and we surveyed our students on their attitudes towards watching video lessons at home. And so for those of you who still might be questioning flipped learning and if students like it, I pulled this for you today um, to show you guys, you know, in the beginning of this class, a lot of our students were disagreeing or strongly disagreeing that they enjoyed watching extra video lessons or doing extra activities online at home in the flipped classroom. And then we surveyed them later on um, my diagram on the right hand side of the screen and uh, far more of those students said that they agreed uh, that they enjoyed watching them and they found them useful. Again, this was in 2014. I wonder what this would look like now um, after COVID and after how many, uh, you know, so many students have experienced online learning and other types of learning. Um, but uh, the point here is that, you know, over time students will really um, start to adjust to the flipped classroom, especially in those contexts. Um, you know, this research was done with a lot of, uh, you know, my students in Macau, uh, mainland Chinese students and Macau locals. And so they really see the teacher as the primary facilitator of their learning, the teacher imparting knowledge onto them, right? Um, and towards the end of the flipped classroom experience, their mindset on the role of the teacher started to shift where they began to see the teacher as a facilitator of their learning as they became more autonomous learners inside of the classroom. So students did go through a little period of discomfort um, in, in the uh, earlier weeks of the class and then they started adjusting and then again, towards the end of the class, um, you know, they they kind of had a different experience uh, with the flipped model, a new uh, newfound understanding of flipped instruction, and um, and what teachers actually do as far as helping them gain uh, uh, language proficiency. Um, I pulled this from my Katisal article back in 2016. I haven't seen much other research out here yet on this, but um, uh, Randy, you mentioned this when you, you introduced me, my 2016 study. Um, and what we did was we gave a pre and post uh, test grammar exam to uh, flipped classroom students and non flipped classroom students with the same content. Um, some of these students were in my um, courses in California. And uh, what we found were, was that uh, some of these students in the flipped classroom felt that they didn't really improve that much. But when we looked at their final exam um, on the post test, uh, they had uh, significantly higher gains on that exam than in the non-flipped classroom. So they were able to raise their scores um, uh, in a way that was significantly um, uh, higher than, than the control group students. And they both started at the same point on that exam. But um, it was interesting because we surveyed the non-flipped classroom students and they actually had greater confidence 
in their uh, language abilities than the flipped classroom students. And so what that signaled to us was that because students um, are uh, working so much more with the materials, they are really gaining a, a lot more grammatical or for our, our purposes in the, in the top group oral awareness. And um, because they're gaining so much more awareness, um, of their you know oral proficiency or grammatical proficiency um they might actually feel like they they know less right but then when we got we went in and we saw the the uh results of the exams they actually improved more in the class so that was a really interesting finding um higher achieving students will spend more time on tasks with the materials online in a flipped classroom. Um, it's just like the research from writing centers on student achievement that those who attend writing centers typically achieve higher grades in their courses. So it's not a big surprise, um, but it's something that can really uh, motivate students to get engaged in your flipped classroom materials when you share this with them. Um, I know uh, writing centers love to share that data with their students to get them into the writing center, right? And it's also a great thing to share with your students if you're flipping a classroom for the first time or if they haven't experienced a flipped classroom to kind of get that student buy-in. Um, and those, those high improvers also had a significantly higher frequency of online partic participation in the course. Um, and um, greater satisfaction with the flipped classroom than the lower improvers in that class. Um, and uh, following up on that note, um, Nichols uh, just finished up a, a 2020 study. I really love uh, Nichols' uh, research question because he wanted to um, ask if uh, the way that uh, students were applying different learning language learning strategies were affecting their outcome or their success in a flipped classroom, or if the way, you know, that their motivations were affecting their success within a flipped classroom. What he found was neither of those were affecting the student's success um, in a significant way. It all came down to the amount of time that the learners were actually spending on the flipped classroom materials. And so those, again, who spent more time um, had uh, higher success um, in the classroom. Um, and he measured that by uh, final grades, not a, a pre and post test like in my study. And so um, again, it just shows that those students who are really interacting with your materials um, are gonna do uh, far better in your course. No big surprise there. Um, Students online uh, like uh, non-text materials and uh, they like online materials if you're teaching an in-person course. So for those of us going back after COVID to our in-person instruction, um, you know, we don't want to lose what we've learned about online teaching in this past year. And we want to we want to keep applying that into our in-person courses. And the best way you can do that um, is by engaging in flipped classroom instruction. Um, one of my students, I always remember this from one of my students' interviews about the flipped classroom, and I'm just going to read this. This student said, well, the textbook is boring and unchangeable. The online instruction is more flexible and trendy. The technology will help us study. It is very different from textbook. We can only read the textbook, but the online instruction is more interesting and this is back um you know way many years ago before my students were engaged and had experienced online instruction so um i i assume you know today students are just as engaged and interested um in any online videos or activities that you can provide to them um and uh uh continue using in your courses within the flipped classroom model so you know, in short, our students are really craving other sources of input besides text materials. Um, and so it's just really important to note. Um, I also remember when I uh, conducted this study, a lot of the students said they really wanted to see their teachers' faces when they were at home 
doing other activities. And so turn on your cameras. They love to see you. And they said, you know, I love it when I go home and my teacher's giving me a little mini lecture for five minutes and I can see her face. It, it makes me focus. It makes me feel like my teacher is there watching me, telling me to study and to do my work. Um, and they really want to see your face if you are using uh, extra videos within a flipped classroom model or even teaching online um, in an asynchronous course. Okay, so I'm going to move us into just a, a little review on flipped instruction and then I'll start pulling out some examples from my project based assignment. Um, and so I think it's just important that we review, you know, what flipped instruction is. And um, on the right hand side of my uh, screen, you can see this chart right here. And um, I know the text might be a little small. It's not so important that you be able to read everything here. What I want to summarize here is that um, a, creating a chart like this is going to be helpful for you if you want to flip your class. Um, and I'm going to pull out lots of other examples and put them in this chart to share with you guys today. So when we think about flipping our class, we want to think about what we're doing in the class and what we're doing outside of the class as the outside of classroom flipped tasks or homework tasks in the flipped classroom, whatever you want to call them. Um, and when I'm looking at this example here um, uh, from a, a course that I created many years ago, it was an integrated skills course. They were, uh, students were studying persuasive techniques. Um, what you see in this chart what you will notice are these action verbs. And so the in-class activities are the activities in the flipped classroom that allow for higher order thinking skills, like creating, analyzing, evaluating, examining. And so when you are thinking about what your students are able to do, we want to see these types of action verbs happening more within the in-class materials in the flipped classroom. And so this is in line with um, Bloom's taxonomy when we flip it. And I know many of you have seen this diagram in the past. I just wanted to review it with you all. Um, traditionally in the classroom, what students would do more of are these skills, understanding new information, remembering new information, um, applying that information, you can imagine the teacher standing at the podium lecturing, the students are taking notes, um, and they're trying to understand and maybe trying to memorize that new information, right? And so these are the tasks that end up happening outside of the classroom in the flipped class. And those are the tasks that you can have students do practice with, you know, uh, vocabulary, maybe learning about new pronunciation uh, nuances or skills. Um, and then they get to do more creative activities, um, analyzing or evaluating um, their pronunciation or their, their peers pronunciation, et cetera, inside of the classroom. So what does this all look like for project-based learning in a flipped speaking and pronunciation course? And I apologize because I didn't really address this term. And essentially what this means, uh, you know, project-based learning is that students will end up creating something um, or applying something at the end of a unit or the end of a course and they're designing a project, right? And so that aspect of designing a project, if I go back, really allows them to focus on these skills, these higher order thinking skills uh, within Bloom's taxonomy model of learning. So I'm gonna introduce to you all a little bit about my undergraduate course. Uh, where I designed a project-based task. Um, and all of the pronunciation activities in this unit lead up to a uh, project-based assessment. And so um, this comes from an undergraduate course that I uh, have taught at UCSB in oral skills. And how I designed the course was that uh, the first unit of that class was all focused on pronunciation. 
It doesn't mean that I wasn't teaching pronunciation throughout the course. I did, and I'll show you at the end of my presentation um, uh, uh, some examples of how I did that. Um, but the entire first unit was focused on pronunciation skills. Um, and the project-based assessment um, was in the form of an online song pronunciation analysis presentation. And I'm actually going to play one of my students' presentations for you all today so you can see what that looks like. And it's really fun to see what they come up with. So when I was designing my course, um, you know, I really had three weeks of activities. And in the first week, I really was focused on teaching segmentals, doing reviews of um, uh, long and short vowels um, and minimal pair rules, et cetera. Um, in my second week, I started getting students working more on super segmental aspects of the English language, for example, working on word stress. Um, uh, stress and unstressed words and, and stress within sentences. And I'll show some examples of those. And then all of this is slowly building up to them working on this final project-based task, task, which was um, their online presentation. So I taught this in person and students did not present in the classroom. They presented online. I also taught this class online. And so, yes, they presented online, but you can, you can flip that uh, presentation and have them uh, submit their actual presentation online if you are teaching in an in-person course. And so um, all of these activities were uh, uh, meeting this objective, which was to enhance accuracy in pronunciation and structure. Um, within this course that I designed. And um, some of the SLOs here are focused on, uh, you know, presentation skills, et cetera, but um, everything designed in um, unit one uh, was really um, uh, working on pronunciation skills, I would say SLO five. Um, and with, with the um, idea in mind that it's so difficult for students to get one-on-one -on -one feedback in speaking courses with pronunciation. Um, some of us might have 25 students in a class, right? So how do we give really targeted feedback on pronunciation when we have 25 students sitting in our classroom? It, it can be a really big challenge. Um, so the flip course that I designed with these online tasks and activities is just a really great way to give each individual student um, feedback on their pronunciation needs, either in class or online. And it allows you the time to do that when you flip your classroom. So um, before I get into the details of the presentation and the activities that um, allowed students the confidence to give this type of presentation. I'm just going to play an example for you all today. So we're going to watch my student Hopley Parks presentation. Um, on the right hand side, this is just a screenshot from one of his slides, but you guys are going to be watching his presentation on the left hand side here once I start playing it. Um, you might notice some things that can be improved in his presentation and that's fine. Um, I chose his presentation because he did a really excellent job with his content of his pronunciation analysis. Um, and I'm also a big fan of Elton John and he chose to analyze one of uh, Elton John's uh, songs, uh, Rocket Man for his presentation. And um, one more note, I'm gonna turn on the subtitles as Hopley is parking, uh, I'm sorry, as, as, as Hopley is talking. And um, you might also notice where he has some issues with pronunciation going on from watching the subtitles. And it's just a great learning tool for those of you who end up having students submit things online and you have the ability for them to go back and watch subtitles as they're speaking. It's also a, a really great uh, teaching tool. Hello, everyone. This is Hopley Park. Welcome to my sound analysis presentation. The song I chose to present is Rocket Man by Elton John. 
He seems a child of astronauts, for whom space exploration is just his daily job. Given this song was penned during the 1970s drug era, people can still say it serves as an extended metaphor comparing fame to space travel. Turning into a rock star made Elton John feel like he was floating in space, which is also a symbol of free. And also, this song has been a staple for John's concert. And back to the singer, he is an English singer, songwriter, and composer. He sold more than 300 million records, making him one of the best-selling music artists in this world. And also, Elton John has more than 50 top 40 hits. Oh, by the way, there will be a film called Rocky Man, based on the life of Elton John, releasing this day. And uh, this photo is a poster of this film. Okay, uh, back to our intonation analysis. Let's listen to this sound, this part of sound together. Actually, I don't really want to stop, but, but it's a very good sound, isn't it? Uh, let's say some interesting point. You can just see how excited he is about his song choice for his presentation here. He's going to go into a little bit of explanation now about different segmental um, uh, and uh, super segmental features of pronunciation that he notices in this song. Um, and so what you guys will start to notice, and maybe you'll be asking, you know, how is he able to do this? And um, I'll be sharing some of the activities that students work on to practice these and then find them in the songs um, in a little bit. About intonation analysis together. I miss it so much. I miss my wife. Alton John used the falling pitch for his first statement, which follows typical spoken intonation rules. But in his second statement, he used the falling pitch first, then a rising pitch, which follows the rules of first half, second half, where falling pitch is used in the beginning of second course, but it breaks the typical rule of the statement. On such a timeless flight, Elton Joy used a change of intonation in the middle of the word timeless to a falling pitch from a rising pitch. This point is actually very interesting because timeless is one word but Alton Joy seems like separated to two words, time, left. And uh, he used a falling pitch for time and a rising pitch for left. And not the mind thing and at home. Alton Joy used a rising pitch for the first half of this sentence, which follows the rule of intro phase, since he tried to introduce the man. And for pronunciation analysis, let's look this three sentences together especially the last words, time, fine, and home. For those three sentences with time, fine, and home, the last 40 were all omitted, including and, and. It's really interesting that Hopley found this in the song because you might be noticing as you listen to him, he actually leaves off the final consonant endings on several words when he is speaking. So it's really, uh, it, it was really a great teaching point for me to point out to him that he noticed that the singer was doing this in the song and that might be okay for the purposes of the song. But when he is speaking, that was something that he really needed to work on to improve his own pronunciation. Which is typical example of shortened pronunciation. Well, listen to it together. <laughs> C 
see it's more like, and I think it's gonna be a long, long time. Till touchdown brings me run again to find. I'm not a mind they think I'm at home. Uh, all last phony is omitted, are omitted. And for some interesting word patterns, till touchdown brings me run again to find. Elton join shortens the word until to tell. I'm not the man they think I'm at home. Actually, Elton join use a connected word by changing I am at to Emma with deleting the pronunciation of T. <laughs> See, it's more like I'm at home. And for some word stress explanations, I miss the earth so much. I miss my wife. Elton John stress earth and wife in this sentence. Since these two words are important in new information he wants to provide. Also, wife are rising in pitch. On such a timeless flight, the word timeless consists of two syllables, including time and less. Typically, there is a very, very short pause between these two syllables. However, Elton John lends the pause in the middle of this word with relatively strong stress and also with a change of intonation. Something else that I pointed out to Hopley was, you know, in those two syllable words, typically we stress the first part of uh, timeless, right? And we don't stress less when we pronounce it. And Elton John did the opposite in his song, right? Um, and that was something that students were working on uh, with um, uh, individual word stress and practicing that in their speaking. From falling to rising pitch. Oh, no, 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 I'm a rocky man. I'll enjoy your reputation on that. Let's do a summary together. In this part of Rocky Man by Elton Joy, there are survival things found of major segmental and super segmental. First, obvious intonation change. Some follow the frequent spoken rule, and some does not. Shorten pronunciation in last word of sentence and shorten word, and connected word, and word stress for new information, and the word reputation, and the pitch listening. Thanks to listen my sound analysis presentation. This is Hopley Park. All right, bravo, Hopley, bravo. He was uh, one of the first students in my class uh, that uh, did this presentation. And so I actually used his presentation as a model for some of my uh, students who did this uh, later on um, in subsequent courses, and they were able to critique some things in his presentation um, and uh, learn from it. Uh, but he was so excited that I asked him to share it with you all today for the purposes of this presentation. Um, so now that you guys have seen this, um, you know, final task that my students do, I just want to introduce it to you and then I'll go through all of the little pronunciation activities that students practiced um, before they submitted this online song analysis uh, is what I call it. Um, and so basically what students are doing are analyzing a song. They get to choose any song of their choice um, and they get to uh, look at the segmental patterns and super segmental patterns that we discussed and that we practiced in the class in the first three weeks. And they submit that final five to seven minute analysis uh, video as their final assignment online. Um, I asked students to explain five things in their presentation. They need an introduction to the singer and the song. Um, then they need to go into um, intonation rules that might be broken by the singer that don't normally follow the spoken intonation patterns um, in English. And then they go into interesting things about pronunciation, maybe words that are uh, difficult to pronounce or um, very important to pronounce. Um, and a lot of them just find really interesting things about pronunciation when they start looking at a small section of the song. 
Um, I asked them to share about um, anything interesting with word patterns in this song that they might notice since we did study minimal pairs, any minimal pairs that they might notice, shortened words or connected words in the song. And then also explanations of individual level word stress or word stress in sentences and why the singer might have chosen to stress those words um, in their song and the reasons behind that. Um, a little bit of advice that I give my students. Um, yeah, I tell them you can play the music from the song in their video, but some of them um, started speaking while their song was playing. And so I always try to remind them, play it in the background, but don't play it while you're speaking, right? Um, and some of them will play it as they have graphics moving on their PowerPoint of arrows popping up and they come up with these really elaborate PowerPoint presentations. I'm not grading them on PowerPoint skills yet in this assignment. Um, it's really focused on pronunciation. And then, as I've mentioned, they upload this to our um, online course management page. And students all watch one another's presentations and they do an activity commenting on them. Um, I have had students uh, create this rubric with me. So this is a student created rubric and um, I am really assessing them um, a lot on uh, their voice, their pronunciation in this presentation, their delivery. And then I do give um, some credit, you know, just for having clear audio quality, things like that as they're speaking and recording. Um, since we do go over the technology that's involved with this presentation and then the content of their song analysis, um, is graded upon uh, that they are covering the four types of analysis, intonation, pronunciation, words, uh, uh, word patterns and word stress that we've studied earlier on in the course. Um, so how, how do we get students to do this, right? What does it look like within a flipped class? Um, I, I'm not gonna read this. For those of you who wanna go back to my PowerPoint and learn about how things flow together, you can read this, but I'm just gonna go through and show you guys some of the smaller tasks and activities that lead up to the final unit, uh, uh, unit project. And I have about 20 minutes left to show you guys these smaller tasks and activities here. So as I mentioned in that earlier chart that I showed you, what I did was I took all of my little class activities and I put them in this chart. What students are doing out of the class um, as homework or flipped homework tasks is what I call them. And then what students are doing in the class. And I want to make this uh, distinction really important for those of you who might be trying to flip an online pronunciation course or an online oral skills course. Um, it's really important that you explain to your students that there are tasks that you are doing in the online class that are class participation. They are not homework. They are class activities. Those are the things that you would normally be doing with your peers inside of the classroom, right? And then there are these homework tasks or these flipped tasks. And I do this whether or not I'm teaching a flipped class in person or online, right? I think it's easier for students to grasp in an in-person class that that's, that's classroom time, but in an online class, it can be hard. You know, sometimes your students might say to you, oh, there's so much homework in this class, but it's not a lot of homework. You know, this is class time and this is homework, right? And so making those really uh, distinct in your class and for your own purposes when you're designing your course is gonna be really critical um, when you go ahead and, and decide to flip a class in an online classroom. Um, so, you know, how I start in the beginning of my class, my students do an impromptu presentation um, about their names. And um, I have them do that in person, in the in-person class or online um, in a short video. And I use that as a way to get to know my students and as an initial pronunciation assessment for my students. And then I go in and I give them in my online class, this is my example, I give each individual student feedback on their pronunciation. Um, and they also work a little bit in this video on um, 
on uh, uh, past tense verbs and storytelling, count and non-count nouns, um, and definition vocabulary, and, and a little bit of work on transitions in this little impromptu presentation. So they get that feedback, and then they go home outside of the classroom, and they redo that impromptu presentation. They redo it. They take my feedback, and then they give their presentation again. They re-record it. Um, and then they write a reflection of some of the improvements that they made on that first presentation. So you can see right from the get go, they are doing a, a short presentation. Um, and then I'm, I'm taking that into the flipped classroom and having them really practice that, that aspect of rehearsal, which is so important. Um, and then applying some of the individual feedback that I've given them. And I keep this feedback and I keep going back to this feedback throughout my entire course with these students as I work on pronunciation with them. So that initial pronunciation assessment is really important to me as an instructor um, in, in any oral skills course. Um, then I go into um, uh, uh, reviewing common phoneme rules in English with my students. They watch a video lecture outside of the classroom where I introduce some really important phoneme rules that are out there. And then students um, in the class or in the online class participate in, an, in a discussion about the phoneme rules handout with one another. Um, and uh, some of them are just mesmerized by these rules. Again, I give each student individual feedback, whether in person or online. Um, and um, I love to use that Google feature when I'm giving some of them feedback on their pronunciation uh, with words that they might be struggling with. For those of you who don't know that feature on Google, you can type a word in and um, students can see where the stress goes within that word, uh, the shape of the mouth. And now they can actually record themselves speaking that word back and Google will tell them if their pronunciation is accurate or not. And they can play it back while also listening to the model pronunciation, which is a really cool activity for them to do. So um, I have some of them practice with that in class and out of class a little bit when, once I give them that feedback. Again, they're all getting individual feedback on their pronunciation at this point in the classroom. So um, they're getting uh, tailored practice with their pronunciation needs. Um, students then go in and they write a short pronunciation mishap story. Um, and uh, they focus on using one minimal pair in their story. And I'm gonna show you guys an example of this. Um, so my out of class, my flipped task, students watch a lecture about minimal pairs and what the pronunciation mishap story is. And um, then they, in the classroom, uh, uh, participate in reading that story out loud in the classroom and making sure that they get those minimal pairs pronounced correctly. And then they go and create their own story together. So that model that I show them um, is, is really fun. And then they go ahead and they write their own story. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So they write a story, for example, uh, Animana and June chose R and L as their minimal pairs. And then they also um, give an explanation on how those two sounds are pronounced, the location of the tongue, the shape of the lips, et cetera. Um, and so I'm gonna show you guys, again, this is, this is a, a short activity for them. It's a homework task, it's not graded. They have a lot of fun writing these stories and learning um, about the way to pronounce these, these sounds that they might be struggling with. Um, and it's really empowering for them as they get to learn about the nuances of how to create these sounds. They uh, tend to uh, write a story about a minimal pair that we have identified as being a struggle for them. So they, they feel really empowered when they get into the nuances of this. So I'm gonna play just a short clip of a Hong, uh, Hong Zay's video here for you guys. Hello guys, today I'm gonna do a presentation for the uh, long uh, and short uh. So, uh, this is our topic about long uh, and short uh. From part one, here is a short story to introduce the ah uh and ah. Uh. 
And so, yeah, he, he's got some issues going on. You know, he's not saying short U and long A. Okay, but uh, let's let's continue watching his story here. So let's start. Here's the situation that Howard, Becca, and Bart is going out to a lake at night. So here's our story. It's, it's such a wonderful night. Surely it is. Although it is too dark here. What? Where's the dark? I've never seen the docks here before. We can see nothing since it's too dark to see anything and be careful with the stones under your feet. Oh, I see. You want to say it's too dark, not too ducks in the lake. You bet. By the way, what are we gonna eat? What about having some fish? I know you love fish. That's awesome. I want to have some steamed cup tonight. Hmm. What are you gonna put into the cup? I mean, eggs or something else? No, no, no. I want the steamed cup, the tasty fish. Well, I think you're talking about the steamed carp instead of the steamed cup, right? You know me well. Okay, tell Bart to come back and let's go home to make dinner. But, 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 but what? Do you want to stay here a little longer? Mm, I was yelling to but. If you're watching the subtitles, he's nailing it, Bart and butt, and even the computer's picking up that he's getting those minimal pairs uh, pronounced accurately in his presentation. To ask him to come back. Well, you should pronounce it a little longer and say like Bart instead of butt. It's really rude to speak others' name in a wrong way. Sorry, Bart. I will pay extra attention to it from now on. Never mind. I'm starving. Let's go home now. Cool. So here's the short story about R and A. Uh, this, and this is part two about the arti uh, articulation analysis about long A and short A. Uh. They, they all are vocal and but there's a difference in the breath that for long ah, uh, you need a long breath like ah, uh, but for the short ah, uh, you, you just need a short breath like ah, uh, like cub or but is pretty short. And they're all voiced about the shape of the mouth for the long ah, uh, it's widely open and rounded. Like you need to open your mouth like ah, uh, like carb or Bart, but for the short, short uh, it's just barely open and pretty relaxed. So I'm gonna pause this here um, as he wraps up. And um, again, this is one way to get students uh, more involved in the details of um, you know individual phonings that they might be struggling with. Also, this short activity exposed my students to the technology that they would need for the final project-based assignment. So everything is slowly building up to that project-based um, assignment there. Hello. Um, I'm gonna move us on and then uh, wrap up here pretty shortly. Um, uh, students move on in my class to study um, super segmentals or the pro prosodic features of uh, English and uh, they watch a video lecture from me on individual word stress and sentence level word stress. And I give them lots of different examples about that. Um, they go into um, uh, practice saying some of those words on their own in the class or online um, via voice recordings. And then I have them also participate in, in a dictation activity where they uh, read, read aloud a summary from Malcolm Gladwell and they have to place the proper stress on words as he did in his, his summary. Um, another short activity, I, I have students watch a video on vocal fry. They write a short summary about what vocal fry is and then they go into their summary and they start bolding the words that are important keywords to be stressed. 
and they have to justify why those keywords are stressed based on the different types of word stress rules that they've studied about. So again, all of this is active, applying, analyzing, right? Um, and also a little bit of practice as they go back and, and read their classmates' summaries aloud and discuss suggestions for adding changes in stress. So um, it's very autonomous, right? They're not doing a lot of um, mimicking in my classroom, but they're doing a lot of applying and practicing within um, an autonomous and uh, very collaborative classroom for the in-classroom tasks, right? When students are learning about those rules, right? Those are things that I can put online to save more classroom for them, uh, more classroom time for them to do all of these really engaging tasks within the flipped class model. And then again, um, I leave lots of individual feedback in the online class. I, I replied to students um, recordings of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's dictation and or in the in-person classroom, I would walk around to different groups and listen to each one of them. And a lot of them had questions and they would get into little arguments about what words he stressed and not and why they might be stressed. And so then I would revisit those groups um, and discuss those with them in the classroom. Okay, finally, what do I do when they are uh, ready to start doing their song analysis and, and present online? I give them lots of preparation time. Um, I give them time to rehearse a part of their presentation um, as in an in, in classroom activity. And they do that with a peer so that they get some peer feedback um, on their presentation before they actually give their final presentation. So again, I really put a lot of value on uh, rehearsal in the flipped classroom uh, for my oral skills uh, uh, students. And um, students also, um, uh, you know, have a little bit of extra time to ask me final questions and ask me for help with things. Um, and I leave time for that. Um, in the classroom or in the in-classroom tasks. And then what I do for my flipped tasks are tutorials on how to record over a PowerPoint like you saw in Hopley's PowerPoint. He didn't show his face, he didn't screencast it, but he just recorded audio on top of his PowerPoint, which was okay for that uh, type of presentation. And then students respond and watch to their peers presentation, uh, watch their, peer presentations online. Um, and then again, I get to give lots of feedback to my students on uh, during their rehearsals before they go and record and upload their final presentations online. And that's it. Then, then their big project-based task is done. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, all of these pronunciation activities are recycled throughout my oral skills course. Um, later on in week nine of my course, my students were working on a different project-based task, which was a group graded discussion. And um, I had students revisit and practice word stress in that unit and, and rules about keyword stress in sentences. Um, and so they had to go in and form some questions for their graded discussion. And what I did as a little pronunciation activity was ask them to bold the words that they would stress in the questions that they wrote. And then also to note if the question had a rising intonation or a falling intonation. And I was able to give them a little bit more feedback on that. So they got some practice, some more practice with pronunciation so that when they got into their project-based assignment of the group discussion, their pronunciation was really clear when they were uh, practicing the different discussion language and discussion rules of that other larger base task. But pronunciation is always there in my class in the background of all of these other project-based assignments and tasks. Um, as I wrap up today, I just wanted to share with you guys um, uh, Beth Shepard's article. I always remember her article from the Katisal Journal. There are so many other free resources for teaching, speaking, and pronunciation online in Katisal Journal. And this article in particular was so helpful for me when I first started out teaching um, oral skills courses um, because all of the materials that she shared were free and online. And then she went through all of these materials with lots of activities and rationales, kind of like what I just did in my presentation today. 
Um, and so a lot of these are really useful to um, incorporate into a flipped uh, speaking course. And uh, finally, I, I just wanted to note the students that I uh, shared videos from um, and examples from, I did ask them for permission today and they were really excited about it. Um, my activity that I shared where students wrote the short story um, using a, a minimal pair was adapted from Mark Manassi's class back at Miramar College in, in 2011. And um, I uh, changed his activity uh, by extending it to the online uh, presentation and then um, adding, in, adding in that articulation analysis component. So thank you, Mark. You know, I think so much of our work um, as instructors is borrowed and built upon and adapted. And um, with the literature review that I had earlier on today, I do have full texts of most of those, most all of those articles uh, handy. And um, if you email them and if you want the, the PDF, I am more than happy to share that with you all. If you shoot me an email at mweb at ucsb.edu. Um, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to wrap, wrap it up. We have 30 minutes for a Q and a today. And, um, so I'm just going to open up time for questions and, or comments, and I can go back to things earlier on. And if you have even, you know, your own ideas and examples of project-based, uh, assignments or tasks that you, uh, would love to, uh, you know, briefly talk about with us today, or that you are reminded of, um, after this presentation, I think it's wonderful to, um, to share those as well. Um, as we uh, have a little bit time left for discussion today. I can't see the chat, so I'm going to... Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that, first of all, we want to thank very much, thank um, Marie. I muted everyone, so maybe they're saying things, but they can't be heard because they have to do the unmute thing first. Um, and then we'll be able to hear what people have to say. I also wanted to say that I will send um, a follow up uh, message to all of our re registrants with whatever um, Marie Webb would like to share. So now we're open for Q and A. Randy, take it up. Well, he's being a little quiet at this moment. Marcia? Yeah, oh, there, there you go. I get yeah, my, de my device is kind of frozen and so I cannot see the Q&A. Oh, you are sort of frozen. Okay, so have we got any questions uh, or um, uh, questions for clarifications or comments that anybody would like to ask? We are now open with open mics, so sh please don't be shy. You teachers of pronunciation, we know that you can speak and we welcome you to um, turn on your mics and speak. So we do have a lot of thank yous here in the chat uh, and we'd like to hear somebody's voice. Hi, Marie, uh, my name is uh, Richard Gray. Uh, thank you very much for coming in today. It was um, a very, a very big eye opener of uh, of how you can just implement so much for the students to uh, really take ownership, um, you know, of their pronunciation of the class as well. Um, I was just curious uh, during I think like the first part of your presentation, you mentioned that there was seven seven weeks of discomfort. I was wondering if you can just kind of give us a little bit of an explanation of what that discomfort was, maybe from the the instructor side and from the, the student side as well? Yeah, thanks, Richard. I, I think that's a great question. Um, and I, it's, it's just so fun for me to go back and look at this earlier research um, because of what's happened with online instruction during COVID. Um, and so uh, this was done uh, with my students at a, a Chinese uh, university, a public Chinese university um, in Macau. Um, and so um, in this context in particular, 
um, I could tell that this, this type of learning was really new for students. So let me just give you a picture of what my students were like when I walked into the classroom back then. When I walked into the classroom, my, my students were really shy, uh, very, very quiet, uh, you know, and uh, sat at their desk and they were waiting for me to speak, but they were being really polite waiting for me to speak, right? Waiting for me to take the reins and uh, leave my class. They were, uh, you know, ready to take notes and um, uh, do a lot of memorization of things in my class. Uh, and they were really studious students. But one thing that they were not used to was a lot of speaking in English, a lot of individual attention to their speaking in English, right? And so when I started flipping my classroom and, you know, for anybody who has taught, uh, you know, it, outside of the United States, I'm sure that you can relate to this experience, right? Students are really looking for the instructor to uh, keep guiding them and they're not really so comfortable with a lot of group work, right? And um, kind of doing things on their own. They're really used to kind of uh, repeating things back to the teacher, right? And um, practicing mimicking things in English. Um, and so that's really how they saw me as an instructor when I first started out teaching the course. And so when I asked them to go online and watch some of my video lectures, you know, that was a completely new experience for them. Um, and back then, you know, recorded lectures just kind of weren't a thing in the classroom uh, like they are now, um, especially post COVID. And during, you know, the end of COVID, I really should say, and during COVID around the world globally. Um, so yeah, it, it was a really um, uncomfortable experience for some of the students. Um, not all of my students watched the video lectures. And you'll see in a lot of the literature that uh, teachers, you know, from my perspective as a teacher, I struggled to get the students to watch those video lectures. Um, and so I'm glad, Richard, that you raised that question to me, um, because something that I didn't really talk so much about was getting student engagement with um, the flipped classroom materials. And so, um, you know, how I get students to spend more time on task with these materials in the flipped classroom is really important. And the way that um, I have been able to have lots of students get so involved in those materials is by making them tied to um, my course grades in my classes. Dire I directly put uh, discussion or video activities or quizzes after a video activity into the grade book. Um, and so that really um, kind of heightens students in a, a willingness to engage in them, if that makes sense. And then also I will tie a short quiz or a discussion forum activity with a video lecture where students have to do something after they've watched that video lecture um, or respond to another student or uh, record a short little video to another student after they've watched a video lecture to, to just tell another student something that they learned and respond back to that student. So again, I get them to do more than just watch a video right? They're not just logging in and watching a video. And earlier on, when I started doing this in the flipped classroom, that was something that I think I struggled with um, as an instructor, was getting them engaged in those, those flipped or online um, tasks in the course. Does that answer your, your question a little bit, Richard? Yes, it did. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Amy, I see your hand raised over there. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and call on you. Hi. Hi. Well, um, so I'm a coworker with Marie at UCSB, and I've also taught the undergraduate uh, oral skills class. And I just kind of wanted your feeling about um, <clears throat> since we've been in such a digital environment over the last year or so, um, comparing the potential for teaching pronunciation with much more flipped. Um, content and comparing it even to our normal classes of academic writing and kind of which um, kind of curious about your perspective like which are you more excited about 
Um, I, I'm definitely more excited about what is happening in the flipped component of these um, of this class. And so, um, you know, I flipped it during COVID in my online course. Um, and so I, I'm just so much more excited about it because of all of the, the tools and digital tools and resources that we have. I think in the in the question uh, in the chat box, I got a, another question that I wanted to address, which kind of answers your question, Amy. And somebody asked about that that fun tool on Google um, where you can have students actually record their pronunciation of a word and then they play it back and Google will tell them if it's correct or not, et cetera. And that's right in the Google browser. It's not in Google Docs. I just wanted to clarify that. I think. I think maybe Marsha had responded and said maybe it was in Google Docs, but it's just right inside, you know, you go to Google, you type in a word and you say, uh, you know, cooperation pronunciation. And uh, this little box will pop right up and students can listen to that word. Um, thank you, Richard, type define word in the chat. That's another way that you can show that to your students. And so, um, you know, Amy, when, you know, in the past, when I would spend time lecturing, introducing these, these segmental rules, right, or these rules of common word stress patterns in English, right, it took away from cool things like this, mm -hmm. that I just didn't have time to do. And all of this lecturing and presenting of information can be done within a flipped classroom and still in a collaborative manner, right? Um, and it's, it's much more engaging for them to do that online, I have found, than inside of the classroom. Um, and then it really just gives me so much more time to really work on these pronunciation activities as classroom activities, if that makes sense. Um, so I really like it. Um, and uh, it's not something that I would, I would just go ahead and try to do for an entire class. I know among my colleagues that have gotten involved in flipping, they just started with like one unit and that was it. Like they just tried to flip one unit of a class because um, it really requires a lot of um, advanced preparation to get all of the materials together online. So I would recommend if you haven't done it, you know, just start with maybe even, you know, one, one activity like I've done in my presentation here, right? Like kind of one activity or one week of activities. And then, you know, maybe the next semester you teach the class, you build up another week of flipped activities, right? You don't have to flip an entire class at once. I guess I was actually pointing to the difference between teaching an oral skills class versus a traditional writing or academic skills class, because sort of intuitively we might think, oh, well, this is oral. We need to be close. We need to really use all of our, you know, auditory and all of this. And that with the technology, it might be an impediment. But I think your experience is the contrary. And so is mine, that it's actually really exciting to, to do all this flipped digital stuff with them. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really exciting. And, and I first started flipping in my, uh, in my writing courses, my writing heavy courses, um, and, and then thought, okay, you know, can I do this in a speaking class? Yeah, okay, I can. All of these, all of these tools allow me um, the ability to do that. So yeah, I think it's really exciting. I see Seth's hand up over there. And so Seth, I'm going to um, just call on you and you can go ahead and, and ask your question. Oh, yes. Well, thanks very much for the presentation. And I think those activities were fascinating. Uh, this, I think, follows a little bit from Richard's question. I just, could you elaborate a little more on the type of learner training that might be useful to prepare the students to work on pronunciation independently? I mean, what, what might they need to know beforehand to, um, to perform these tasks effectively without maybe, you know, practicing inappropriate patterns or, or doing this in the absence of, of uh, immediate feedback? You know, I don't know if I really understand the question about like learner training to prepare them to work on it independently. Um, I, I do give them, you know, a lot of individual feedback on their pronunciation, which is just a big goal of mine in teaching an oral skills course because um, my students are so diverse. They have, you know, so many different issues. You know, one student has this issue with pronunciation, another student has this issue. And so if I take pronunciation issues and try to address 
you know, one, one thing with the entire class, it's not really relevant to all the other students. And so that's why it's been really important for me to give them that individualized uh, pronunciation feedback uh, within, within the flipped classroom model. Um, what, what do you, can you tell me a little bit more about what you, what you mean by maybe the type of learner training, or are you maybe talking about getting students uh, to practice pronunciation on their own without the feedback? Well, I'm thinking of what, um, it'd be like maybe a study skills type of thing, or what techniques they should use uh, in addition to the actual content of pronunciation. I mean, how, what are the things that we might want to let them know beforehand that they have to be aware of, um, how they should, I don't know, maybe the best practices for, for um, you know, just practicing or, or, or producing what they need to produce. Yeah, I th so okay. I, I whatever think you can do to, to like give them some background to, to work uh, independently. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question there. Marsha, did you wanna chime in? Um, yeah, I, I started doing this kind of teaching back in, um, I don't know, 2012, 13, 14, something around those that age. And that was during the time when people said to me, you can't teach pronunciation online. And I, you know, I just said, watch me. <laughs> and and um, it took several years before the college would allow me to do this sort of like newfangled thing. Um, but what I did was I prepared little videos that were orientation to studying online or, or studying the materials that I was providing them online. So if I wanted them to do both book and video, then I actually showed them how to do that. If I was asking, like, having them do particular software that was available online, then I did a video on how to access that, which would be everything from what is your username and password? Where do you go and what do you click on and what do you look for? So I provided little videos like that to sort of get them started if that's something that they had not done. Now, nowadays, our students may be, you know, depending who we teach, right? So I think at the university in an IEP, you have students who have a lot of background in doing things digital, but maybe if some of us are teaching adults in adult schools where we don't have students of that background, we have to provide more kind of tutorial videos just to getting started. So I had a huge long section on getting started and there were a lot of little video clips that I created thinking about what is their background and what do they know already and what do they need to know to sort of get into the content and that's that's in addition to doing the content lessons yeah i think marcia um i mean everything that i've done and shared with you all um i have a tutorial of it um and so um you know when i introduce you know here's my student hongze he's screencasting over his handout that he made, right? Instead of taking his handout and presenting it in class, he's presenting it by screencasting over it, right? And so what I did earlier on in the course was show students how to uh, use Screencast-O-Matic in their browser, which is just so, so easy for them. Um, and for those of them, uh, most all of my students had access to that, to that point uh, at, with the video camera. Um, and for those of them that didn't, they were able to do that um, via voice recording. And that's okay for me to some extent. Um, but in some of my courses, I have noted a camera on, um, you know, and, and I think some of us have that option at schools that we teach at, you can know a camera on policy for your online courses as well, um, because it's important that you see their faces um, and that um, you can see their gestures, you're working with them on gestures as a part of oral skills courses, right? And you want to see them, right? So lots of lots of video tutorials, Seth. Um, and uh, I don't use a lot of other technology outside of my learning management system. So if I set something up on a forum, Seth, where I had students practice um, 
uh, word stress and reading word stress of sentences. I didn't make them go to another site to record or video record. I use the discussion forum. I have them reply. There's a video button right there and they click on the video button and they reply. I don't have them jumping around to all these other platforms. That was something that I found early on in my flipped classroom research. Um, and going back to the question that I had gotten earlier about maybe why students were so uncomfortable in my earlier flipped classrooms was because I was using so many different types of technology and having them, oh, go to go to this site, go to, you, you know, record here, do this, do a voice thread here. And now what I've learned is I keep everything on one LMS and I have them record everything using that LMS um, platform. And I don't make them go out and learn all these new tools. The only new tool that my students learned was a Screencast-O-Matic or voice recording over a PowerPoint, that was it. Everything else was in the learning management system at the school that they already had a little bit of knowledge on how to use, um, if that makes sense. Great. Great. I think we're out of time. Are there any other questions? All I don't right, great. That is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, you've given us uh, great examples. Um, and as you said, sometimes it's better to give an in-depth one example from beginning to end to give us a chance to understand how you set it up and how the students can um, actually uh, do their presentation. So that's terrific. And um, I just think it's wonderful. So I thank you very much for um, having the um, giving us great preparation and we really enjoy what you've done for us to today in your presentation. And I think some of us have some great ideas. I don't know if anybody feels like their mind is just going and going and going about, wow, what projects can we give for the students that uh, we have? So thank you very much, Marie, for that. Um, before we close, just a few more things about how um, there are still a few weeks left, a few weeks left for anybody who wants to work on or give their students opportunity to use some online pronunciation materials as well as grammar and writing and uh, vocabulary development, idioms, conversation, uh, listening and speaking kinds of activities free through the AM English program. Um, all you have to do is send an email to info at Sunburst Media to get a little bit more information about how to get set up for you and your students. A reminder that we do have wonderful reasons for um, our guests to join Katisal and uh, keep in touch with us. We'll let you know the next time that Teaching a Pronunciation has an event. Thank you very much. I will now stop the recording. Bye, take care.